Well, it's a real pleasure to have Jim Irons back here. Jim, uh, four years ago, talked to us about the Landsat 8 mission and the science uh, from, from that mission. Now, Jim is also a new retiree, having just retired at the end of December. And so now he's in Marison, Meredith's at Goddard. So, uh, Jim led the Earth Sciences Division uh, uh, for uh, the last four years. Now, that division has 200 civil servants and 1,200 associate Earth scientists. 1,400 people, all in Earth Sciences, and mostly in Building 33. It has to be one of the biggest uh, Earth Sciences organizations in one building in the world. That's got it. You know. So, it, you know, the scope is broad. The atmosphere, the oceans, the biosphere, the cryosphere, and the geosphere, all in one building. Amazing. Jim uh, is a graduate from Penn State University with a bachelor's in environmental resources management, a master's in agronomy. He came, then came to, uh, to College Park, University of Maryland, where he got his PhD in agronomy. When he joined Goddard in around 1980, he joined the Biospheric Sciences Branch, where he was the Landsat 7 <coughs> Deputy Project Scientist. From that, he moved on to the Project Scientist for Landsat 8. And so, as I said, he's now been the director of the Earth Science Division and just recently retired. He's going to tell us what Earth Science is about. Let's welcome Jim. Thank you, Arlen. Thank you all for having me today. Hopefully we'll get the uh, computer rolling up quick. Um, I have way too many charts. It's typical for a scientist. Uh, so I'm going to uh, buckle your seat belts. I'm going to roll quickly. But uh, if you want to interrupt and answer, ask a question, please feel free. Uh, just shout it out and uh, do my best to answer. Hey, it's working. All right. <clears throat> So as Arlen said, until uh, this January 1st, I was the director of the Earth Sciences Division uh, and was uh, at Goddard for 43 years. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Chris Scalise uh, had a uh, senior management retreat. And in preparation for that retreat, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center was surprised to learn that the single biggest source of funding for Goddard was Earth Sciences. So, um, if for no other reason, if you're not interested in earth science, it's uh, because uh, one thing that should get your attention is it brings a lot of, a lot of business to Goddard. But there's a lot of other reasons as well. So today, it, it advances, there we go. Uh, so today I'd like to just briefly touch on NASA's earth science program as a whole. Uh, talk about the Goddard Earth Sciences Division. Uh, but uh, Earth Science at Goddard doesn't end with the code 610. Um, there's also Earth Science flight projects, many of which are managed by the Earth Sciences uh, Project Office, code 420. And then I just uh, <coughs> would like to finish up with my view of what Goddard's Earth Science priorities should be. So uh, as you're probably aware, all of the science lines of business at NASA uh, are guided by decadal surveys, which curiously enough come out once every 10 years for each division, um, and are prepared uh, under contract to NASA by the National Academy of Science and the National Research Council. Our most recent survey uh, for Earth Sciences came out actually in January of 2018, in the final version didn't come out until September, but uh, it's referred to as the 2017 Earth Sciences uh, Decadal Survey, Thriving on Our Changing Planet. The person most responsible for implementing 
uh, the recommendations and the guidance from the National Academy of Sciences at NASA headquarters as the uh, director of the headquarters Earth Science Division, who is currently Karen, Dr. Karen St. Germain. Uh, Karen replaced uh, Michael Freilich uh, and the acting director, uh, Sandra Kaufman, when she came to uh, NASA headquarters in June or July of 2020. Uh, she had been uh, previously the uh, Deputy Associate Administrator for NOAA and their National uh, Earth, uh, excuse me, uh, NOAA Environmental Satellite and Data Information Systems uh, Group. She is uh, an advocate of uh, distrib using distributed uh, satellite systems uh, with small sats and cube sats. Uh, she's enamored with that approach. And she is also very interested in advancing uh, our data information systems to create a more open uh, data system that helps to accelerate scientific discovery. And uh, last year she referred to as 2022 as the year of Earth science. The decadal survey I mentioned um, designated or, or listed um, five what they called um, designated observables. Uh, one was aerosols, one is mass change, one is surface deformation and change, uh, the fourth is surface uh, biology and geology, and the Fifth was uh, called uh, clouds convection and precipitation. Uh, Mike Freilich kicked off um, intercenter architecture studies to implement observing systems to uh, observe each of these designated observables from the decadal survey. At Goddard, we led and combined. Uh, the two areas of aerosols and clouds convection and precipitation into one observing system. So, uh, although all of the architecture studies were intercenter, Goddard led one that was called ACCP, uh, while JPL led the uh, architecture studies for the other three, uh, other three designated observables. Uh, the reason. Um, it was fair because uh, the, uh, what they called the CATE, the, uh, the budget estimate from the National Academy of Science, if you put uh, aerosols and clouds convection and precipitation together, they estimated it should be about a $1.6 billion system. Uh, the other three combined that went to JPL were estimated to be uh, less than a billion. So uh, we got the Goddard Space Flight Center got the bulk of the work. So I'm going to return to this briefly, uh, this chart. Uh, Karen St. Germain has begun uh, calling these collection of future systems the Earth System Observatory. We used to have an Earth Observing System. I'm sure you'll remember the next thing will be the Earth System Observatory. The the Cato survey also recommended uh, a set of observables to be addressed by Earth Explorer missions, which are to be um, derived from, uh, uh, from proposals. They, they are to be competed, with each having a cap of $350 million. That's for an entire flight project, including launches. So they're relatively small. And the first announcement of opportunity for uh, Earth System or Earth System Explorer missions uh, is intended to be uh, released this year in, in 2022. We haven't seen it yet. And then finally, NASA uh, headquarters uh, in Earth Sciences is, uh, in fact, in all of the sciences, is very much interested in evolving our data and information systems to a more cloud-based system that will allow more open and uh, transparent access to both the data and the models that we use to study uh, the Earth, uh, the Sun, the planets, and, and the solar system. So um, there is a there's an initiative 
uh, within the Science Mission Directorate and within the Earth Sciences Division and headquarters to develop these more open uh, systems. And I'll return to that and our role in that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, the bottom line is that um, Michael Freilich managed to maintain a healthy earth science budget uh, throughout the Trump administration despite presidential uh, budget requests that reduced uh, the funding for earth sciences at NASA. Uh, most of those reductions were overturned uh, by Congress and our appropriations remain pretty healthy on the order of two billion dollars or close to it. Uh, the first presidential budget request from the Biden administration increases uh, that uh, funding in FY22 uh, by a quarter of a billion dollars to uh, two billion two hundred fifty million. Uh, if it, we ever get a budget enacted, uh, we'll have uh, more money uh, this year than we've had in the past, hopefully, for Earth sciences. Uh, and uh, the reason that uh, amount went in uh, was to initiate uh, the Earth System Observatory, to start the Earth System Explorers program, and to continue the development and uh, ultimately the launch of the satellite systems we have uh, ongoing right now. So let me turn to the Goddard Earth Sciences Division, uh, which is code 610. I know you're all used to using codes. Uh, the Earth Sciences Division is comprised of 13 organizations, or mostly they're called labs. But two of those uh, organizations, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and the Global Modeling and Assimilation Office, or GIS and GMAO, are predominantly engaged in the development and uh, utilization of climate models in the case of GIS and Earth, uh, Earth system models in the case of GMAO. And I'll, I'll return to the little bit of a distinction between those. We have two organizations, uh, the Global Change Data Center and the Terrestrial Information Systems Laboratory uh, that uh, work primarily on the uh, processing and the archiving uh, and the distribution of data from both our satellite systems and from our, from our models. And then the other organizations are Earth Science Discipline Based Laboratories. So by, uh, by division or by laboratory, there's a group of five laboratories that are uh, focused principally on atmospheric science. And then we have uh, five laboratories with, that are a potpourri of other earth sciences, uh, including the biosphere, that, that's basically terrestrial life, uh, geodesy and geophysics, that's where the satellite uh, laser ranging and the very long baseline interferometry uh, programs are managed and executed, hydrology, ocean ecology, and cryospheric sciences, which is ice. Uh, real people work uh, in the front office. Uh, that, that the X is through the uh, least attractive picture there. That was uh, me uh, until January 1st. Dr. Matt McGill is the acting director. Uh, the vacancy announcement for the position of director closed, I believe, last week. I don't know who applied, and I'm not part of the selection uh, for my uh, successor, but I'm sure uh, that will be a very uh, competent person selected, and the three most important people in the division are in the bottom uh, row, the uh, project support specialists, the uh, administrative people who run the division, uh, and we have an excellent uh, administrative officer, Michelle Vendera, so I want to give them their props for, uh, I, I couldn't have done the job of uh, division director without them. Uh, as uh, Arlen mentioned, uh, we are almost as big as the other three science divisions combined uh, in the Earth Science Division. But we are six to one, the ratio is about six to one between uh, people who are not in the civil service and our 200 civil servants uh, that work within the division. And so 
Most people uh, work within the division through contracts or to, uh, through cooperative agreements, and then we also have the, the NASA postdoc program and interns uh, engaged in our workforce. Money. Money is always important. Uh, last year, fiscal year uh, 21, uh, we brought in uh, $241 million. This isn't the money, it's not the total budget for all of our science at Goddard, it's the budget just for the division. So it doesn't include the flight project funding, and I don't have those numbers. But for the division, uh, $241 million. Uh, about half of it comes from research and analysis and the uh, NASA Applied Sciences. Another third-ish uh, comes from mission operations and data analysis. An important part of our um, portfolio is we received funds on the order of $10 million last year from other federal agencies and other entities that pay us uh, external to NASA, provide reimbursable funds to the division to research uh, and analysis uh, across the division, and in some cases provide data products uh, for organizations like the Air Force, uh, for uh, FuseNet, which is uh, a network of information, the famine early warning system, and, and there's many other examples. What I'm proud of, uh, in the five years that I was either acting director or director, our uh, budget increased from 207 million to uh, now 241 million, and those last two years were during the pandemic. So I think we did did pretty well uh, with respect to budget uh, over the last five years. Um, towards the end of my tenure, our, our uh, line of business uh, lead uh, Julie Breed, who's in Code 101, the new business office. Uh, helped us put together uh, some retreats uh, where we discuss the strategic priorities uh, going forward for the Earth Sciences Division. And uh, through those retreats, we came up with this uh, vision statement. Uh, I had used a vision statement that said uh, Earth Sciences Division uh, serves the nation as the world's most trusted source of comprehensive information on the state and the future of the Earth system. That was a mouthful. It was uh, reduced down to here during the retreat. And uh, also during the retreat, uh, five uh, goals were captured. Uh, we want to remain NASA's center of excellence in Earth system science. We want to attract and retrain a diverse world-class Earth science work workshop diversity is a long-standing goal at Goddard and what I'm um, also proud of is that it has uh, gained renewed attention or renewed focus over the last couple of years at Goddard and within the Earth Sciences Division. Uh, we want to lead the innovation of science and technology, conceive, capture, and deliver current and future Earth Science missions, then finally, architect and lead this open information system that I discussed earlier. I'll return to these themes. Um, so, what, so the, the question people ask uh, is, so what? I mean, why should NASA have an earth science program? Why should Goddard care to be a major, or maybe the major, um, Center for that. Well, the first part of it is hopefully these will run. Yeah, uh, this is from the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. These are five-year running average of uh, Earth surface temperatures from surface measurements uh, over the last 100 years, and um, showing that the world's changing, and in particular, uh, one of the most uh, telling results or telling changes uh, for the world is a global increase in temperature. And you can see by the time we've reached current times, the present, uh, that the temperature has increased uh, more 
in the Arctic, that's referred to as the Arctic ampl amplification, but it has increased on average over the entire globe. And these increases have impacts, and we work to understand the causes of this. So this is surface data, this is not modeling. But this is the result of um, GISS's uh, model called Model E. It's a climate model. It operates on a fairly coarse spatial scale and, and over a long temporal scale. So their model uh, goes out hundreds of years um, to trace the uh, changes uh, to the Earth in, in many respects, uh, but is particularly as summarized by temperature. But what the model does is it allows analyses of what the causes of uh, those changes are. Changes, the causes of those changes are obvious. In the next chart, oops, keep going, there we go. So the next chart is from the GMAO, uh, Goddard Modeling Assimilation Office um, model, Earth system model called um, GEOS. Uh, Goddard, <laughs> afraid you were going to ask him. Goddard um, Earth System, I forget the acronym, it's GEOS. Um, and um, it's an Earth system model, which is like a super souped up weather forecasting model. Except it does more than your typical uh, weather forecast model. It's run uh, to, uh, in, in part, to help uh, NOAA learn from the model and be able to make better forecasts oper operationally, uh, but also to understand what's going on across the globe on shorter time frames and higher spatial resolutions than uh, the, the GIS uh, climate model. And this is a visualization of carbon dioxide emissions and transport across the Earth. And what you can see is that the emissions are low during the summer months because vegetation in the northern hemisphere observing carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere, but as you get into the fall and the winter, well, you can also see carbon dioxide coming off of uh, wildfires as well. And see that carbon dioxide transported uh, across the globe. And in addition, the, the um, GMAO model is four dimensional. So you got space, horizontal space, you got altitude in the atmosphere. Uh, and you have time. And you see as you move into the winter, where we're burning more fossil fuels in the northern hemisphere, and the vegetation is absorbing less of the carbon monoxide, you have greater concentrations of carbon monoxide to the point where we're well over 400 parts per million uh, in general. Yes, sir. Is that based on uh, 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 surface emissions? or on uh, observations of CO2 in the atmosphere? Um, yeah, so it's based on, um, it's based on uh, assimilation of satellite observations, primarily from OCO, uh, the uh, Ocean Carbon, or excuse me, the <laughs> yeah, Carbon Observatory too, from JPL. But uh, the GMAO is a leader in data assimilation into models. And this is one of the powers of, of what they do in GMAO is to be able to do that. So, um, so what are some of the impacts of uh, carbon dioxide increasing in uh, increasing in the atmosphere and the increase in the uh, global temperatures? Well, one of the impacts is that the ocean is absor absorbing most of that heat and uh, as a result of absorbing most of that heat we're seeing an increasing number of hurricanes and we are seeing hurricanes experiencing rapid intensification over time. Now this is a data product from 
a program called iMERGE at a Goddard Space Flight Center where the data from the um, GPM, the Global Precipitation Mission, as well as an international constellation of other uh, cloud and precipitation observing satellites is put together to, um, to provide estimates of precipitation rates globally once every three hours. And um, through those observations, through those um, measurements of precipitation, you can see hurricanes developing and tracking across the oceans onto the land and dropping off uh, a, lot of, a lot of rain under our land surfaces, causing heavy damage from winds and floods. And it's just a, well, it's not just, it is, is a highly sophisticated observation of one of the impacts of global, global climate change uh, that we make at, at Goddard Space Flight Center. Another observation we make, principally from uh, microwave radiometry, uh, is the extent of sea ice uh, globally. And this animation is a animation of the uh, mean, or excuse me, of the minimum extent of the Arctic ice sheet uh, since 1975 until 2020, uh, which occurs in late summer every year. And as has become obvious, uh, the impact of global warming is that the minimum ice sheet in the Arctic uh, has decreased substantially and to the point where we now have a northwest passage uh, through the Arctic at that time of the year when, where there's never been one before in recorded history. And this is part of what I talked about before, the Arctic amplification. Ice and snow on ice reflect a lot more solar energy back to space than water. Water's dark and it absorbs solar radiation, solar energy, and heats up. And so as temperatures have gotten warmer and the Arctic ice sheet has decreased in size, there's an amplification, there's a feedback mechanism from having more open water than ice. And consequently, the highest increases in global temperature have occurred in the Arctic. And then um, also based on uh, Goddard analyses, of data from JPL missions, GRACE and GRACE follow-on, that measure gravity. Um, oops, go back. Over the years, uh, we're uh, observing um, the loss of land ice from uh, glaciers and places like Greenland and Antarctica. So, we are able to track, and, and the, uh, the Goddard Geodesy Ge Geophysics Lab, they do the gravity field calculations with math much higher, way over my head than I understand, and from those gravity field calculations, they're able to measure the loss of ice uh, from the Antarctic and from Greenland. When you put that together, you're losing the ice to the ocean, the ocean's getting warmer and expanding, it results in sea level rise. Again, these, uh, these measurements are from JPL, primarily JPL-led missions uh, of radar altimetry, but the analysis of the data is done at Goddard. And uh, this is on uh, a graph from a um, website called uh, climate.nasa.gov. Uh, JPL runs this website. <clears throat> it's a nice website, but they do attribute these analyses to Goddard on their website, which for which we're grateful. Um, I don't want to belabor this one, but uh, another point is that uh, sea lot, uh, from our Goddard analyses, sea level rise is not uniform across the world. It's just not <coughs> filling up a bathtub, a bathtub. So there's different places in the world where sea level 
uh, rise is greater than other places. Um, <clears throat> so when I talk about earth science, system science, that means putting the, the entire picture together because the biosphere interacts with the cryosphere, interacts with the oceans, interact with the atmosphere, they all interact, all these components of the earth system interact together. One thing we have the ability to do at Goddard is to put full stories together. So for example, there were wildfires in 2021, and every year, but they were really bad in 2021, in recent years. And um, through our observations and our modeling, you can show in June of 2021 that the soil moisture was low across the uh, western U.S. From observations principally from the soil moisture active and passive satellite that was a JPL-led mission, but the passive uh, microwave radiometer was built at Cotton. And the active radar that was on the system failed soon after launch. So SMAP is really only a passive observing system, but it still allows good estimates of soil moisture and with modeling through the root zone, and, and we can see in early summer uh, there was uh, low soil moisture. In addition, through measurements of surface air temperature, there was an anomaly in air temperature. It was hot. Um, the summer out west in 2021 was hot and dry, and then observations of uh, wildfires were made from Goddard built satellites, uh, principally Modus and Beers, and, uh, and captured in a portal uh, which shows where uh, active fires are occurring. And then through the GMAO model, um, GEOS, uh, <coughs> Goddard was able to attract, uh, track the transport of the aerosols from those fires uh, across the country to the point where those aerosols impacted the air quality right here in the eastern eastern U.S. So, uh, what you know, what Goddard has a unique capability to do is to, is to tell the whole picture. Um, and then going back to the GIST model, you, know, you think of impacts of climate change. Well, they're able to predict climate change out hundred years or more and then do analyses to determine what that impact might have on uh, for example agricultural production across the world so this is a study done at GIS and as you can see uh, if, you, if you can read the uh, legend there the reds are reduction in uh, in maize crop yield uh, in those areas of the world and so climate change it doesn't look good for corn, and I didn't put the chart in the uh, I didn't put the chart in the presentation. It's not so bad for wheat, uh, but it looks like in the future corn's going to have a tougher time, and wheat's going to do better. Not all changes are due to climate change. Uh, this is a uh, visualization of uh, tropical rainforest deforestation in Amazonia in an area that's uh, comparable in size to the U.S. and it's been tracked since the early 1980s with uh, Landsat data. And what we've seen has been the loss of tropical rainforests uh, and the conversion of that land to agriculture. Uh, however, those changes, while not caused by climate change, they have an impact on the climate. Uh, re uh, reduction in the ability to assimilate uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the burning puts carbon dioxide right back into the atmosphere. So now um, Goddard built an instrument called JEDI which is on the International Space Station. Um, like ISAT-2 and ISAT, it's a laser altimeter, uh, but it is, was built and intended to make measurements of uh, the height and the density of vegetation. So now, in addition to the two dimensions of 
forest cover you get from instruments like uh, the ones on Landsat or MODIS on Terra. Terra is providing that third dimension of height and uh, to get a better estimate of the carbon stocks in the forest of the world. It's not all bad news. I, I promised uh, Arlen PK I had one, one chart on, uh, on ozone. I have the ozone experts in the audience, so I'm, I'm not, I'll be brief. <laughs> but, uh, the bottom line is, is due to observations that have been made possible by uh, Arlen PK and other people at Goddard. Uh, we've been able to attract, um, track the depletion of uh, stratospheric ozone which uh, protects our, our world, the planet, from harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun, amongst other things. Um, the good news is that in, um, what year was it, 1980, I forget, PK, uh, there was an international agreement signed called the Montreal Protocol and to reduce the production and use of chlorofluorocarbons, which were the chemicals that were destroying ozone in the stratosphere. And as a result of that agreement, which has been pretty well adhered to by the nations of the world, the ozone uh, hole is beginning to recover. And um, so it gives us some hope that as uh, climate change uh, occurs, that the nations of the world can get together, reduce uh, through the Paris Accords, for example, the emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and we can mitigate some of the impacts of, of uh, carbon change, uh, of global climate change. I wanted to mention that um, people at Goddard and the Earth Sciences Division and beyond are engaged in many, many field campaigns. So we not only make measurements from space, we also make measurements from aircraft and on the ground. This is just one uh, called above. Arctic Boreal Vulnerability uh, Experiment. Uh, this is a field campaign that's ongoing in Alaska in the Northwest Territories of Canada uh, to, uh, to study the impact of climate change on the ecosystems in those areas. It's a 10-year study. Goddard has a group uh, within the Biospheric Sciences Lab that is managing that field experiment. Two weeks ago, when the uh, snowstorm uh, impacted uh, the Northeast, we had Goddard scientists uh, involved in measuring uh, the snow and the causes of the snowstorm from the WALPS P3 aircraft and from the NASA Ames ER2 aircraft. And every year, it's uh, been slowed by the pandemic. Uh, Goddard scientists are usually involved in somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, field campaigns per year. Uh, I, I wanted to mention applied sciences. That, uh, the NASA or Science Division has a whole applied sciences area. The, the main purpose of that area is to do transition to transition research to operations. So we take our understanding and provide the information and the knowledge to agencies like NOAA to improve their weather forecast, for example. Uh, this is just one example of a uh, applied science project that le led by NOAA, it's, uh, led by Goddard. It's called the Applied Remote Sensing and Training Program, RCEP program. It's a uh, training program. And since uh, 2009, <clears throat> they've trained over 86,000 people in the use of uh, observations from sat NASA satellites, and, and those people have been spread all over the world, more than 500 countries. How am I doing? Eh, too bad. Uh, I mentioned earlier this one NASA strategy for uh, Earth infor or for information systems, including an Earth information system. Uh, Goddard put together uh, three pilot st uh, studies uh, last year to demonstrate the ability to uh, apply advanced IT technologies to create an environment where uh, specific issues could be studied in an open platform using things like JupyterNet, 
notebooks, if you know what those are. I don't really, it's just a name. Uh, but it allows people to do um, uh, collaborative programming uh, across, you know, uh, across multiple locations, multiple institutions. And um, so we took a lead in demonstrating the potential uh, for developing a more open information system for, for NASA, uh, NASA science. Okay, I want to go very quickly over um, flight projects. Uh, Karen St. Germain counts 23 flight projects in operation uh, for Earth science, NASA flight projects for Earth science. Uh, Goddard, I don't suppose you can read most of them. Uh, so many, many of those, uh, a large proportion, were developed in uh, Goddard. And uh, the ones, uh, ones that are in development or in formulation, uh, we have an active role in those as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, leading most of those projects is the Earth Science Project Division, or Code 420. Uh, Jeff Lawson became the director. Uh, of Code 420 in December, and he's great. He really brings a wonderful background. He was the test uh, project manager, and uh, immediately before taking this position, he was the deputy director of uh, headquarters astrophysics. So he knows project management, he knows headquarters, and that's a really important background to have for this position. So in the in uh, uh, the project, Earth Science Projects Division, there's the Earth Science Data and Information System Project. They're the ones who are going to, who have implemented and run our current data systems and will have to be instrumental in developing the future systems. Um, there's the Earth Science Mission Operations, ESMO, projects. There's the one, that's the group who runs our Mission Operations Center. And then all the flight projects in development, the flight project managers, uh, report to, uh, to Jeff. Our most recent launch was Landsat 9, launched on September 27th of 2021, continuing what is now a 50-year uh, program of Earth observations, beginning with the uh, launch of Landsat 1 in July uh, of 1972, when I just graduated high school, so it's a really old program. Uh, NASA, Goddard, has been responsible for developing and launching every one of the successfully uh, launched Landsat satellites. The only one that was unsuccessful was Landsat 6. Goddard was not involved in the development and launch of Landsat 6. All the other ones were done at Goddard. Uh, it just became operational uh, on January 31st. Operations are turned over to the U.S. Geological Survey within the Department of the Interior. Uh, first light image was collected on October 31st, and uh, that flight, uh, those first light images uh, were presented uh, by the center to Vice President Harris when she visited Goddard on uh, last November 5th. Another important component of Earth Science at Goddard are the NOAA reimbursable flight projects. Now, Landsat's not a reimbursable project, appropriations for the development and launch come directly uh, through Congress to NASA. But in the case of our weather satellites, our primary weather satellites, uh, the appropriations come to NOAA and then NOAA uh, reimburses NASA Goddard to develop the main weather satellites for the nation. And so right now we're working on a, uh, the GPSS, Joint Polar Satellite System. One's been launched, uh, second launch is coming up. Uh, we also uh, develop, manage the development of the geostationary uh, weather satellites. The GOES satellites were in the R series. Two have been launched, two more are scheduled for launch in the future. <clears throat> and then we're working with NOAA to uh, formulate the follow line missions to, to the GOES R series, now called GOX. I want to mention PACE. Uh, PACE is in, I think it's phase C. Um, it is a satellite that will carry an imaging spectrometer to make observations of uh, chlorophyll uh, in our global oceans, but not only to just measure the chlorophyll, instruments, uh, other instruments have done that in the past, but also to be able to differentiate the species of phytoplankton that are 
a uh, hole in that chlorophyll, and that has a big impact in understanding how much carbon dioxide is being absorbed by the oceans. So it's very important. It's a very um, demanding, uh, technically demanding mission. Uh, and right now it's scheduled for launch in uh, 20, uh, 2024, I believe. Uh, the next one we have, we have two big flight projects in formulation. One is Landsat Next, which is a follow-on, uh, will be the follow-on to Landsat 9. But we also have this atmospheric observing system which is the, what's the flight project that will address those two designated observables I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, aerosols and cloud convection precipitation. The architecture that has been presented and accepted by NASA headquarters has satellites in um, two orbits. One's a polar orbit, which is scheduled for launch nominally uh, sometime around 2030. And then two satellites that are in a, a, a not an equatorial orbit, but a lower orbit, uh, which are scheduled for launch in not the late 2028. So this is a very important system to atmospheric science and to Goddard in particular, that we continue to develop the lead. Headquarters wants to, to uh, divide the two orbits into two flight projects. So one, they might, names could change, uh, but that's basically the architecture we proposed in concert with other NASA centers to address, and, and the external atmospheric science community, uh, to address those observations that were designated in the decadal survey. So, that's chart. Hey, right on time. Um, <laughs> Good. Um, so this is my view of what Earth science priorities are. We are a leader in advance in Earth system science. We need to continue to maintain our leadership, uh, to characterize and predict the impacts of climate change, <clears throat> and to observe and accurately predict the water, energy, and carbon cycles at uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal time frames. We need to continue our applied sciences. We need to transfer our knowledge and research to operational agencies for societal benefit. That's a really important component of what NASA does. Why do the research if it can't, if the research cannot be put into practice and had to help people? Um, we, I want to see Goddard lead NASA's development of this Earth information system. Um, springboarding off these pilot projects that I mentioned earlier. Um, got, there needs to develop the flight projects we've committed to, some of which I've discussed briefly, uh, and we need to successfully compete for future Earth science projects through the Earth System Explorers program and another uh, program called Earth Venture Projects, which are competed through announcements of opportunity as well. And then finally, um, something that's near and dear to my heart that I tried to work on as division director is we can do better in communicating the amazing accomplishments of Goddard Space Flight Center in our sciences to both headquarters, to our own Goddard management, uh, to policy makers, to educators and students, and to the public in general. So to me, the job's not done if you just publish a paper in a refereed science journal. That accomplishment, that knowledge has to be communicated more widely, more broadly. Candidly, I don't think that even in headquarters and even within our management at Cotter fully appreciates the scope and the depth of the work that goes on in the uh, Goddard Earth Sciences. Uh, and finally, my own bias. I, don't, I think Earth Science is the most important program at NASA. There is no other program that has the immediate impact on people uh, more than the Earth Science program. So thank you for your attention, and please, any questions? I told you to go fast, I warned you. 
Yes, Ernie. Yeah, I was interested in the AOS satellite yeah. system. Is it UV based spectrometer? Say again, Ernie. Is it UV ultraviolet visible spectrometer? No, we do not. That's what it said. There's not a UV spectrometer. It said UV vis. Thank you. Can you go back? Yeah. To this. It's not really a. Uh, it's not a chemistry issue. I, I was wondering if it could be. There, there you go. The last one under AOS E1. Oh, I take it back. That shows what I know. We do have a U. U that's that's a contributed spectrometer from Canada. Okay. So yeah. But uh, this is primarily chemistry is not really part of the problem. It's it's more aerosols and clouds convection precipitation. Did it? Yeah, correct. And we've been able to get any uh, useful Earth science data from uh, the Discover mission? From Discover? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two Earth science um, instruments on it uh, EPIC and, and NISAR. I'm not even sure I pronounced NISAR correctly. Uh, I think the most useful data has come from EPIC, but it provides uh, every three hours, it provides a view of the uh, solar illuminated the, the daytime portion of the Earth. And um, Alexander Marshak is the project scientist that is, has led those analyses and uh, quite a bit of information about clouds and clouds formation, particularly diurnal cycles, that come out of the, the Discover mission. And plus, it's really cool. Um, you know, there's been some great, um, I didn't put it in here, he used to finish a lot of my talks. Is on occasion, you can see the moon. Uh, transect across the uh, surface of the Earth and discover that's always been a, a dramatic uh, <coughs> visualization. I've seen, I've seen some videos of that, yeah, it's pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, Jan? Um, is, is public affairs still pretty easy? Like, can you publish something to get them to help you write up a public release on it? Yes and no. <laughs> How's that for it? Um, there's, there's a couple problems. In fact, Karen St. Germain just had a meeting on retooling earth science communications across the agency yesterday, which I learned on. One advantage of being an uh, emeritus. Um, so there's two, there's two things. At Goddard, our, our communications is fragmented. Uh, there's the Science Visualization Studio. There's the Earth Observatory. There's the Earth Science uh, Writers, and there's the Office of Communications. They work together, but they all kind of do their own thing. And then so much comes out from Earth Science that it is difficult to put a spotlight on any one thing we do. So if, uh, and, but I recommend, um, if, you, if you don't visit the Earth Observatory website, it's excellent. You can go to the Science Visualization Studio and if Matt Radcliffe comes, uh, he can talk about that. He's an excellent ad producer of videos for um, uh, using material that comes from the Science Visualization Studio. You can go to nasa.gov slash earth and there are feature stories there on earth science. Um, so the, the real challenge I think, Jan, is, is just so much. There was this challenge of putting this presentation together, right? I didn't know where, when to stop. And uh, it's just a, a whole uh, fire hose of information that makes it difficult to really focus down on, on some, you know, what are the most important. You know, every year I ask, what did we learn about the Earth this year? And what's the most important thing we learned? It's really hard to answer that question because we learned so much. Yeah. <laughs> do, you know, uh, do you know how navigable the Northwest Passage is nowadays? Uh, not, I don't really know, but I know that it's navigable. It, part of the year, not the whole year, because it free freezes in the winter and closes up. But it's late summer, mm -hmm. there's a Northwest Passage that's on there. Yeah. I was going to ask, what is NASA looking for? 
for the day when people finally realize, holy cow, this place is heating up, we've got to make changes. And I was pleased to see some of the programs which are forecasting ahead. Maze, for example, other things like that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's a big national, international issue. They just had the uh, convention of the parties in uh, Scotland uh, in November to try to uh, reaffirm the Paris Accord. Paris Accord's great first step. It's not enough. You know, we're going to continue to increase CO2 emissions unless more stringent measures are taken to reduce CO2. And as, you know, as we encounter, uh, I think it's going to be uh, severe weather uh, that's going to convince people that we need to make a change because the damage from hurricanes and wildfires in the last few years has been huge. I don't, I don't have the data, but billions and billions of dollars have resulted uh, in loss have resulted from these events that are, um, if not caused, at least made more likely. And, uh, made worse by, by the impact of climate change. Well, let's thank our speaker again, and thanks, Jim. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. And I'll be here shut down if anybody wants to talk some more.